That makes it pretty. And a pity. I've never been to, to the African continent before. Oh. So I, I, so I only have to do it virtually now. Okay. Uh, you are in it now. You are in it now virtually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are live on YouTube. Uh, that makes it pretty. Yeah. I, I got a pop up. I've never been to, to the African continent before. So oh. I, I, so I only have to do it virtually now. Okay. Are you in it now? No, no, we have a feedback. Probably you have to mute the, the, the YouTube. Yeah. So video. Hmm. And I'm going to try if I can open it as well. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so now there should be no feedback here as well. I, I muted my, my tablet as well. And I tried the chat, that should work too. I think so far, there's only one viewer on on YouTube, but we have five minutes to go. So sorry, Ellen. Can I ask a question if you don't mind? Yeah, of course. These guns, they look like cowboy guns. Yeah. <laughs> cowboy? <laughs> Are you from Texas? <laughs> no, actually, no. <laughs> but um, I I like um, Western movies or movies at all, and. Um, I try to have a, like a movie poster, the first slide for all my talks. And okay. so for, for the DDD talk, yeah, this is the Western style. That's cool. <clears throat> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I'm getting old now, so I'm not sure if I know what's cool anymore. I sort of. Okay, sorry, Sad Art, I had to mute you because we had a noise. So yeah. if you want to say something, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. <coughs> sorry. Hello. Hello, hi. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah, good to hi. see you. Too. Hi, everybody. Hi, Oliver. How are you all? Yeah. Hello, Sharif. How's it going? I'm good. Yourself? I'm good. Thank you. Hello, Bob. Good to see you. you. It's been a while. Yeah. I hope um, everybody in the immediate is safe and uh, healthy. Yeah, I think so. I think we are good. Can't speak for the mind, but otherwise, yes. <laughs> Knock on wood. Yeah. So much. I, uh, I got an ap appointment for a, a vaccination tomorrow. So, Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a waiting list and they just called me a few hours ago. What are you doing tomorrow in the morning at 11? And, uh, so I got lucky. I was lucky. It's nice. We actually had it very well organized out here uh, where I live. There's basically an organization that says, sign up here and we'll tell you how to go about registering and it'll just, you'll get an invitation and you show up 
and you get vaccinated and that's yeah. it. And it was at a local fire station. So it was well handled professionals that knew what they were doing. Uh, worked out rather well. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, we, we have a big vaccination center here in, in Hamburg, the, the city where I live. In the, um, it's actually in the, um, in, in the big hall where they're, they're usually doing exhibitions and stuff. Hello, Bob. Um, but and it, it, it's also um, well organized. And they have different priorities for different groups. So they started with the people over 80 years and then 70 years and, and so on. And now they started to, um, yeah, to, to open it up and now you don't have priority to have priority and everybody can get a shot. And so that's why um, I came up uh, with it now. Well, Hello, sorry, is that Bob Allen of Clean Code? I'm sorry, again, please. Are you the Bob Allen of Clean Code? I am the Bob Allen of Code Craftsman Saturdays, if that's your question. I'm that <laughs> crazy man that puts on a code retreat twice every month. Okay, all right, thank you. I'll send you the link. You find thank the you. chat. All right. Yeah, talking about the chat, I, right. I posted- but No, new... I'm not the, the Uncle Bob Martin, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank He's you. actually got, I think it's a registered trademark on that name. I'm not kidding. <laughs> really? He does? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> okay, so what do your nephews and nieces call you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, not too many of those. Okay. They call me old man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have uh, one nephew and one niece, but um, they're too young to yeah, yet to call me uncle or, or something, <laughs> whatever. Well, when your beard turns this color, they'll call you old man. Yeah, probably they would like call me old man. <laughs> you know, but what's funny about that? Yeah, that's the <laughs> It's okay. just on the front. <laughs> yeah, two weeks ago um, was my birthday and I uh, turned the age which is the answer to our questions, um, 42. And actually on that day, <laughs> I, I found the first white hair <laughs> in my beard. So maybe <laughs> I'm heading your way. Bob. The time is coming, the time is coming. The time is coming, I think so. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I close that. Six, 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 two. Um, I think we are just seven people here. Maybe we can wait for like three minutes before we can yeah. get started. Of course. I think um, if, if my YouTube app on the tablet is not lying, there I see three people in the chat. I don't know if that means um, so many people are watching the stream. Well, the other way to do it is to look at the list of participants, which numbers seven total. <coughs> seven participants and already, um, I think three continents in the call, so. <laughs> Everything's fine. So there's the link in answer to the question. I'm the crazy Bob that does code retreats all the time. And this next one is more than a code retreat. It's actually a global experiment. And when I say Thank global, you. I'm not exaggerating. That people cool. in New Zealand, Australia, India. There's actually a list of countries on the registration page. Nice. So, 
I hope it'll work this time. This is the third month in a row I've done it. Cool. And how do you work out the time, the different time zones? So uh, very carefully, basically, I say days begin where the international date line has been passed, which means population wise in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So, okay, great. That's where days begin. So let me see if I can engage some people in New Zealand. And if I can, that will be great because we'll actually have a chance of something going all day long. But then I got to also fill in all the gaps between where there are huge population centers like in India and in EU and the US. So getting from New Zealand to India is not a small thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially when you're focused on people that are interested um, in actually writing code together and have mm -hmm. some clue what the heck mob programming is about. Mm -hmm. But the basic premise, which I'll explain here because I think it's really interesting, it is to me anyway, mob programming has a couple of characteristics that are really, really differentiating. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been a contractor and showed up on your first day at work, how long does it take you to get a machine and become useful? Typically days, maybe weeks. On the other hand, if the group that you're joining is doing mob programming and you're in the same physical space or you're doing it remote, you can be effective in an hour tops because you can actually be catching up and contributing Yeah. In like no time, flat. So intake, piece of cake. If you're doing mob programming that team all the time, every day, guess what? If life intercedes and you have to go do something else or someone on your team does, it's just no big deal. It's mm -hmm. like, have a good time. Be sure to write. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> It's just not a big, it's not a trauma. Mm. So I thought, huh, if intake and leaving, changing the constitution of who's in the mob can actually change pretty painlessly. What if in the morning mm -hmm. you woke up and worked with a group of people that was to your east or to your west, uh, uh, to your east, excuse me. And that's who you worked with up until a nice, easy to understand break in the day, lunchtime for you. For them, it would be the end of the day. Mm -hmm. For you, it would be a meal break. Mm -hmm. After lunch, you would work with a different group of people that was to your west. Mm -hmm. You would be their afternoon mob, their your, or their your afternoon mob, you would be their morning mob. Yeah. And so on, and so on, and so on, all the way around. So it's a bit you like a, a run. And how is it called in English? In German, it's called Staffellauf, uh, where you have this this bar. You run, and then you give this bar to the next runner, and he. Uh, oh, it's a relay, a relay race. A relay yeah. race, exactly. Except it's not yeah. a race. It's not a race yeah. at all because <laughs> no one has to work more than they would normally work in the course mm -hmm. of a regular day. Mm -hmm. So. That part's painless. If the software can actually, if we can actually make this thing happen, and then that's what I'm trying to do with this crazy experiment of mine to prove that it is possible to do, that it works. Imagine a piece of code, let's say an open source project that a lot of people are really interested in, really passionate about. Maybe it's got something to do with world peace or COVID or or uh, I don't know, saving the planet, something like that. Okay, great. What if that piece of code could actually transform every hour all the way around the planet again yeah. and again and again? Yeah. That would be like, holy crap. That piece of code that I worked on yesterday, that's three features ago now. <laughs> yeah. I got to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a very interesting experiment. I'm yeah. looking forward to to hear if it works out, and and I I check the link, maybe, I can be there. On the other Excellent. hand, Saturdays and Sundays are always reserved for the family, so and they're they're mostly. 
So times. after this month, after June, I'm going to switch the experiment part to separate it out from the code retreat part. Code mm -hmm. retreat will stay on the second Saturday and Sunday. And the experiment part will be exclusively just the experiment part on the third Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. because I'm crazy that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's um, 16 here. Yeah. Almost 16. So I think we can get started. Yes. So, Henning, I will ha hand over to you so that we can start with us. Okay. Thank you, by the way, for putting this together. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's uh, um, what I would also say. Thank you, Oliver, for all the organization and um, getting this stuff working. Cool. And welcome um, to my talk. It's all about the domain honey, um, which is an introduction to DD to domain driven design. Okay. So, as I said earlier, with me, you always go to the movies. But as you all know, we have to sit in the home cinema. But nonetheless, I think um, this will be a great night. And first of all, I have a very important question. Is there anybody in the, in the call who does understand German? Because then I would like to make some cheap German jokes <laughs> at one occasion or the other. But I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> so then, then it would be great if you could um, write your country into the chat so that we see um, where are all the people here in the, in the call coming from? I'll do you one and, better. Sorry? The reading feature. I'll do you one better. <coughs> and um, there, there's a chat here in the Zoom call. And we also are recording on YouTube. And they're also streaming on YouTube. And um, Oliver will also have an eye on the chat there. So if you have questions, um, put them in YouTube on the chat or here in the Zoom call. Just raise your hands or, ju or just um, open your microphone and ask your question. So we are a small round and that's, that's good. So we can all um, have a closing round and talk about questions. Okay, so domain driven design um, will be our topic or hashtag DD design, as we say in the internet. And um, who are you going to spend um, the night with? My name is Henning Schrempner. And as you can see here, um, I've grown a beard after I got my last identity card. And I have a background um, in computer science. Um, so I've studied computer science here at the University of Hamburg. Also, I'm a proud dad. Um, those are all mine. And wow. Thanks. And um, the smallest one is, is missing here. Um, um, my baby daughter, she's uh, about 40 months. And I work um, in Germany at a company that's called WPS, and I work as a coder, coach, and consult. So that's what I say, CCC for DDD. And so when I'm lucky, that means I get my hands on the keyboard, as you can see here at the left. Um, but as you all know, um, the prices go up to the right. So that's why I usually work as a coach, as a consultant. That means I coach teams um, in software architecture or in domain driven design, or usually in both. And um, there's half of my time I, I, I'm giving training. That's why I say coach here. And the other half of my days I spend as a consultant. That means usually I work with teams with their old software, their legacy software, which needs uh, to be modularized, which needs to be modernized. And that usually means you have a big ball of mud, you have a monolith and you want to cut that into pieces. And DDD, the major design, of course, can help there very good, especially with the strategic design. So that is the DDD in the large. And what I enjoy as a technical person very much is um, that I see uh, many different technologies here. So you can build a monolith, you can build a big ball of math in every technology. So um, you can do it in, in Java and .NET equally. And one language is missing here on this slide. That's the language where you can do it best. That shouldn't be maybe be here. That's, of course, COBOL. And there's still many COBOL monolith systems out there. And 
that's as a technical person, I enjoy these different technologies. But of course, talking about DDD, talking about domain driven design, it's not so much about technology, it's more about the domain. And that's also nice with this job because I see many different domains, many different businesses, and they all have different problems. Yes, but they all also have a shared, a, a common problem, and that's this monolithic product. Okay, the company I'm working for is WPS called Workplace Solutions, and we are the one with the touch points. Okay, so DDD, Domain Driven Design. Um, what, what's that all about? Domain Driven Design means we're focusing on the domain and we're focusing on the domain people, what we can see here, which we can see here, the user. That's our job. We want to make the work, the life of our user easier, faster, more efficient, or in one word, we want to make our users work better. That's our job. And we're using software to do that. But we must never forget, it's our main goal is not the software. Our main goal is to make the work of our users better. Okay, so what's um, the contents for today, for the next, I don't know, about 45 or 60 minutes. Um, eternal wisdom um, I want to share with you. Um, eternal wisdom I also want to question. We will see um, this eternal wisdom. Well, how, how eternal can it be? What's eternal wisdom? I will give you an example. Um, eternal wisdom when we look into the cinema, into the movies, is um, that the main character will never die. So we can be pretty sure James Bond is never going to be die, uh, never going to die, even if the villain puts some um, lethal machine up, then he will always be rescued. So the main character will never die, is an eternal wisdom. And then came Game of Thrones. I don't know if you've watched this, but spoiler, um, everybody can die in this show. And when we come into our profession into computer science or programming, we also have eternal wisdom. And we also have to question this eternal wisdom. One, uh, one uh, word, one sentence that we learn from the pragmatic programmers uh, is the dry principle. You can see that here, don't repeat yourself dry, D-R-I, D-R-Y. <clears throat> and yeah, as you can see here, don't repeat yourself because it's important, I put it several times here. Um, on the blackboard. And that is something that we learned is good. So we don't want to repeat ourselves. We don't want to have <clears throat> um, duplicated data, duplicated code. We don't want redundancy. That's something that we learned and that's always true. Well, not always. We will see when we look into strategic design that it's true for a specific place and that it should be questions uh, for other places. And the same is true for what we can see here, um, that um, it is good to normalize your data model. So we learned we want normalization as far as we can go. So it's best to go into fifth normal form. Um, that's also something that we are looking at and see where is this right and where maybe uh, we should think uh, about something else. Okay, so DDD, the measure of design, um, defines a lot of buzzwords. Um, after this talk, I hope that you have an idea of all of them. Um, and I assume most of you have heard these words. Um, we can see here there are three pillars. Um, of DDD, collaborative modeling, strategic design, modeling, and code. And then there's one big overarching principle here shown in the middle. The overarching principle that's called ubiquitous language. Ubiquitous language means we as developers want to understand the language of our users, of our domain experts. Remember, those are the important people, the users. We want to understand their language, the language they are using when they are working, their working language, their business language, domain language. And we want to use that language everywhere. That's why it's called ubiquitous. 
we want to call it, we want to use it in um, our diagrams and in our written and spoken communication, and we want to use it in the code. So we want code that uses the words that come from the domain. That's why we call this language ubiquitous. And then um, we have collaborative modeling. That's the first pillar of DDD. Collaborative modeling means um, we developers model together collaboratively with them, the users. So we want to have users and developers in one room, ideally, or today in this time in, in one Zoom call, and they should work together on the model. What's the model? The model is um, the piece of software that we are, are working on, that we are building. We are looking at the domain, at the real world, at the business, and we are supporting this business, this domain with our software. And that means we're building a model of this domain in the software. And this model should not be built all alone by developers, but it should be built together with the domain experts. That's why we call it collaborative modeling. And we have event storming, we have domain storytelling that are as different methods. And as you can see here, the domain expert, of course, that's a very important person that we need. So that's the first pillar of collaborative modeling. And then we have the second pillar, strategic design. That's DDD in the large. We look at the domain as a whole, and we ask the question, how can we make this big mess smaller? What are the smaller units that we can get? So we look at the subdomains that our domain is made of. And the basic idea is take one subdomain and build one piece of software per every subdomain. So do not build the big ball of mud anymore, but build a modular system for every subdomain in the real world, we build one piece of software, one module, one bounded context, as we call it in DDD speak. So that's DDD in the large, strategic design. And then we have DDD in the small, tactical design, or also called modeling and code. I was talking about this domain model earlier. So we are building a model of the domain in our code. And that's what we that's why we're calling modeling and code. So we want to find the, all the things and all the actions that are there in the domain. And we want to find them also in the software. So we look at which people are working in the domain, um, which work objects are they working on, which actions are they doing with these work objects, all this stuff we are taking into the software. And there are a couple of, um, of design patterns that can help us there. They are called building blocks of DDD. Entity, value object, domain event, those are the most important ones. Thank and you. yeah. A quick uh, suggestion on ubiquitous language, maybe put associated with that something that's a common term and probably even as well understood, if not better, domain specific language. Because it's, I think, the same yeah. thing if I'm understanding what your meaning is. Yeah, um, well, thanks, thanks for that point. Um, it's, um, th th those two terms are related um, and they are not totally the same. So a, a mm -hmm. domain specific language um, is, is um, a programming language that let us, lets us express um, the concepts of one specific domain very well. And um, the, the idea of ubiquitous language is um, that we are using domain terms in the code and we can do this in a DSL, in a domain specific language, but it's also possible to do it um, in a, in a um, general purpose language. Um, so the, the, these contact, uh, concepts, they, they, have a, they have a relationship and they are not totally the same. Um, when we look at examples later, I think that will uh, be more clear. Okay, those, those are concepts from DDD itself. And when we look left and right of DDD, there are also interesting concepts there. Um, microservices, still one of the hype uh, topics of our time. If you wanna build a microservices architecture, then you need um, 
the right organization and the right cut for your microservices. So which microservices do you want to build? How do you, are you going to build it? And usually the right cut for this is um, a cut that's based on the domain. That's usually the best cut. And that's, um, the, that's the idea of strategic design to find this cut, to cut your domain into pieces, into subdomains, build one piece of software for that. And that can help us for a microservices architecture. So um, if you ask me when you want to build a microservices architecture, then you need to um, understand what DDD, what strategic design is about, because that will help you there. Other names that we hear here there as well for microservices are self-contained system or vertical. And we can argue if these different names mean are the same or if they have a different meaning. Um, but for now, let's assume they, they mean the same. And all of these names, they have interesting parts. So micro means these services have to be small. Self-contained systems means every service should be um, able to live on its own, should be viable at least for a short time. And vertical, that's also interesting. We want a vertical cut first. So we don't start with layers. We start with slices. You start with a domain cut, we start with subdomains, and then we go into the architecture of the names. Okay, and then also interesting here, clean architecture, hexagonal architecture, onion architecture is also another name that we use there. Those are architecture concepts that go well together with these DDD stuff. So um, in a real world project, um, in my opinion, you want all this stuff, you want all this stuff combined, and what you usually want to build then is what I call the architecture hamburger. Maybe we have a second later to, to look into that. Okay, CKRS event sourcing. I don't think we have the time today. Um, cloud, well, if you have a microservice architecture, then the step into the cloud is not too hard. And Agile, um, DDD was developed in the Agile community, especially in the uh, XP community. So um, we, will hear, we will hear many agile words here, which doesn't mean that you can't use ideas from the D if you have to work in a waterfall project. But of course, well, I'm, I'm not speaking for the waterfall um, model here. Um, but nonetheless, if you have to work in a waterfall project, um, it's still a good idea to, to try this stuff. Yeah, and Bob, um, you're right. Um, <laughs> that's a, a thing that uh, always um, comes up. Why, why is this architecture called hexagonal? Why are, do we have six sides? And <laughs> this is the good reply. So because it was easier to draw. I think the problem with four um, edges is um, we already have the stuff that's layers. <laughs> we have already layered architecture and then we had to come, can, had to come up with something more in five sides that's strange. So then, then there's six sides. Okay. Um, I think hexagonal architecture, also very interesting topic that may be something for um, the meetup. Um, as well, but I'm not going too deep into this topic today. Bob, you wanted to say something, right? I was just saying that's why I sort of prefer the ports and adapters because the intention is much clearer with that terminology. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, I also like the names clean and onion architecture because they also focus on what's important on, on, on pieces that are important. clean architecture shows we want to have the domain code in the inside very clean. We don't want to have the, all this technology stuff um, in our domain code. And onion architecture, that's also a nice metaphor because we have rings like in an onion and the, the, the most inner part is the most important part. And then we get all the stuff um, on, on the outside. Okay. So um, let's look at an example um, to see what these maybe theoretical sounding concepts mean in real life. And well, I always like to tell a little story like my father does here. He's reading a fairy tale to my sons here. And um, since I live in a port city in Hamburg, um, 
And this is a story about seafaring and seafaring today is container shipping. So we have this container here and this container um, is um, loaded onto this container ship here. And this ship sails from Asia to Europe. So here from Shanghai to Hamburg. So this is the city where I live and we have this um, Elf Philharmonie is this building called. And the ship sails um, around half of the world without problems. Let's assume the Suez Canal um, is, um, has no problems at that time. And then it arrives in the Northern Sea. And then the ship comes to a problem because the port of Hamburg, the city of Hamburg is not located by the sea, but by a river. So from the Northern Sea uh, that you can see here, you have to sail up the river Elbe to come into the port. So we have a seaport that's not located by the sea. That's kind of strange, of course. And that um, means we have several problems here. As you can see here, um, the seaport is located not by the sea, but on a river. And when you compare the river to the open sea, um, we have two problems. One problem is the river is narrower than the sea, of course. And what's even more problematic, um, is that um, the, the river is shallow, it's shallower than the open sea. And that's quite the opposite of a container ship, a container ship that's wide and a container ship has a big depth. And you can see that it's about um, 100 kilo kilometers that you have to sail up um, the, the river Elbe from the Northern Sea to the, um, to, to the port of Hamburg. 100 kilometers is about, I don't know, 60 or 70 miles. Um, so we see that's quite a long stretch that we have here. And of course, that raises the question, how is that supposed to work? How can we get those big ships into this small river? And the first answer is no way, can't do it. But the second answer is, yeah, well, let's find a way. We have um, a special authority here in Hamburg. It's called the Hamburg Port Authority that takes care of all this stuff. And this Port Authority, they have and beside other um, facilities, they have the so-called Nautica Center that you can see here. And the Nautica Center is a bit like the tower when we uh, talk about an airport or think about an airport. So at an airport, we have these aircraft that are starting and landing and the tower is coordinating that. And here we have the Nautica Center and the Nautica Center is coordinating what kind of ship sail into the harbor, out of the harbor and <clears throat> on which berth the, the ships um, should, uh, should end up. A berth is, um, uh, talking about domain language, a berth is um, a place where a ship can um, stay when it is in the port. Um, I don't know, Bob, is that a, a word that you, as a native speaker in English, is, is that some, that, that's a word that, that, that you usually know, or is that? No, berth is a well-known term. Okay. I stumbled about, about that the first time when, when, when I came into this. this when, it, when it's spelled that way with an E, now okay. if it's spelled with an I, it's a very different situation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also a very common word, right? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay, so and what the guys in this Nautica Center are doing is before they get the ship into the port is that they are simulating this maneuver. So um, they are using a big sheet of paper, simulating that to sounds wow, simulation. But uh, the classic simulation is a big piece of paper that you can see here. Um, so there's something colorful in the middle, that's the river. And then we have here the, um, the buildings that are um, on the river side. And we, when we zoom in, then we see this colorful stuff. Those are numbers, so-called depth numbers. So this means at this point here, we have 11.5 meters from, um, uh, from the top of the river to the bottom of the river. And <clears throat> of course you can see that there are many other numbers. So here's 11.5 meters, there's also 11.5 meters. And then here's 11.4 and you can see the color changes because every half meter we change the color so it's easier to to spot. 
So in the other direction, we have 11.7, 11.8, 11.9, and then 12 meters. That's now a dark blue here. And you can see there's also this line here, a so-called contour line. So we have depth numbers and contour lines as important elements of this um, big map. And this map is also called a depth map or a sounding chart because um, this, this map, this chart is created um, by echo sounding. So here we see um, a small ship that's called um, Deppenschrieber, that's lower German for a uh, depth rider. And that's what these ships are doing. They have an echo sounder on board and sail through the harbor and measure the depth with the echo sounder. So they are sounding the depth um, and then they're riding the, the, these depths up. And they are doing this to create these maps here. And these maps we can then use to find a route to make this ship simulation. So for example, if we do have a ship that has 10 meters depth, then we can see no problem that can sail here in the middle, but you can see here 9.4, 9.9, 7.5 meters. That would be a problem here. So the ship has to sail here in the middle. That's what we are um, using um, these, these maps for finding a route because then the ship is not uh, running around the real world. Running, that letting a ship running on ground here in the simulation is much cheaper than doing that in the, in the real world. Okay, so we have the sounding ships. They um, measure the depth and then they send this depth into the headquarters of the port authority where these maps are created. Where these maps are created. Um, so finally they um, uh, print out or, or um, plot out um, these maps after they have calculated the right color and these contour lines and all this stuff from these small numbers. And these maps, they go then to the nautical center and you can see here those maps, they go into a drawer, something like a cupboard here. And so we have many drawers because the harbor is so big that we need several maps of this stuff. And when we, are, when we want to do the simulation when a big ship enters the river mouth, then we take out the big map, um, the, the, the sounding chart, the, the depth map, and put it onto the map table. And then we take another piece of paper. That sounds a bit strange, but it's true. Another piece of paper that you can see here, a so-called ship silhouette. And the ship silhouette is, of course, um, a silhouette of the, the ship that's out there in, in the river mouth. And you can see here, there's a scale. And that's an important detail because, of course, we want to have the same scale for the ship silhouette and for the map here. And, well, this looks a bit silly, but to be honest, it's, um, it's a very pragmatic way to simulate a maneuver. And it, ha it has been used um, for decades um, and it is a good system um, to, to simulate maneuvers to bring ships into the harbor. Because when we have, again, a ship with 10 meters depth, then we can see here 10.5 meters, 10.4 meters, not a problem. 10.2 would be okay. But here 9.9, .9, that would not be enough. So we have, would have to move a bit more south. And there uh, would be a route to bring this ship into the harbor. I'm curious, are there alternate charts or some way of reflecting on a single chart, the high and low tide, assuming tides are a factor in the Hamburg ports? Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Um, I, I, I said earlier, let's assume we have a ship that has 10 meters depth. Um, when we look at the, the biggest ship, the big container ships, they don't have 10 meters depth. They have up to 14 or 15 meters depth. Depth. So when we look into this chart here, um, we, we cannot get um, such ship, uh, ship into the harbor. And this um, map is to, to answer the, the question um, with a tide. This is at um, a standard uh, standard zero, or I don't know what's it called in English. So the the, um, the, the the normalized version when we when we have low tide. So there's no high tide. So worst case. Worst case scenario, exactly. 
But um, what we are doing is we are using um, the flood, the high tide, to bring in the big ships. Ah. Um, so we, we will use another, uh, another work item here that can, you can see here. It's a so-called tidal curve. And this, this tidal curve is a forecast um, of, the, of the tide for the next 24 hours, like a weather forecast with the difference that this, will, that, that this is pretty accurate because the tide um, is, um, <clears throat> is, is made by the moon and a bit by the sun. And yes, weather does also play a role, but um, the most important factors are, are moon and sun and how moon and sun are going to move in relation to earth. We know that pretty well for the next, next 24 hours as well, at least. So we can see here, um, if we have low tide now, ebb tide here, and we can say, okay, we can't do it now with 10 meters, but, um, oh, sorry. But um, in uh, four or five or six hours, we get here yeah, three meters or even 3.5 um, meters more. And then the, the nautical officer, he, he takes this number, okay, 3.5 meters more, goes back to his depth map and says, okay, um, I won't have uh, 10.2 meters, but 13.7 meters, and that may be enough. So that um, when we answer the captain of the container ship, or well, the nautical officer answers the, the captain on the, on the container ship, he says, you can take the, the route X, Y, Z, and you have to do it in this time window, because then um, the river will be deep enough, because we have flood. And of course, this is the simplified version. When you go deeper into the domain, there's a lot of more stuff that's also interesting. So there are pilots and uh, different pilots for different areas of the river and so on. But for, for the point I want to make today, this is already complicated enough. So let's look at this story again. So we start with a sounding ship, these small ships that are have the echo sounders on board and they measure the depth in the harbor. And then uh, they send this depth numbers to the cartographer. That's the guy who uh, creates the depth map. And to create the depth map, he calculates the contour lines from the depth numbers. And then he takes the contour lines and the depth numbers and draws the sounding chart or the depth map. And this depth map he sends to the nautical officer or navigating officer is another word here. And when now a big container ship arrives, then the captain asks uh, the navigating officer for a route. And then the navigating officer um, takes out the depth map and his ship silhouette, or if there is no ship silhouette already, then he takes his pair of scissors and a cardboard and cuts it out. And then he moves and turns the ship silhouette around on our big piece of paper, on our depth map, to find the route. And this route is then finally uh, discussed with the captain. So um, what you can see here is only part of the whole story. Uh, what I left out here is the part with uh, the tidal curve because it didn't fit on the slide anymore. What you can see here, that's the so-called domain story. I believe uh, Sonimir Spajic was um, at your meetup um, last, last year and, and talked about, uh, about domain storytelling, but um, I, I don't know if, if everybody was there. So the, the basic idea of domain storytelling is one of these methods for collaborative modeling is we let our users, our domain experts tell their story and why they are telling it. We uh, paint it as a picture and show our domain experts, this is what I have understood. Did I understand you correctly? Because this understanding is very easy, especially between developers and, and users, of course. Okay, what are we doing now with this domain story? We can use it now to build software out of it. Now, of course, that's the next, next question that we are going to ask as developers. Well, it's all um, nice that they have this pragmatic solutions uh, with um, all these paper stuff and this ship silhouette, but of course, can we build an app? And it's interesting, um, 
the several attempts were made to build an app for it. And the first attempts um, were no success because it um, wasn't easy to build a solution that was as good or better as the old paper solutions. Only when we had big touch displays, then we could build a, a solution that was better than the old paper solution. And only then the old paper solution was replaced. And here you can see the old paper solution and the new digital solution. And this is very nice to see what domain-driven design means on a UX level, on a user experience, on a UI level, user interface level. What we can see is the basic idea is we take all the stuff that we have in the real world, in the paper world, and put it into the computer, and there we make it better, we improve it. But we start with a model of what we have in the real world. So we start with a, a depth map. We have a depth map here with the numbers on it, and we have a depth map there in the computer with numbers on it. And I said, we're going to improve it in the computer. We're going to make it better. So here we have very small numbers, and we need this lens here to, to uh, make the, um, the numbers bigger. And here in the computer, we already have bigger numbers. Plus, we have this zoom in and zoom out feature of the computer. And when we zoom in, we do not only see the same numbers as bigger numbers, but we see more numbers, we see more details. And of course, the, the other way is, is true. When we zoom out of it, then we see less numbers. And this is the uh, this is the, the depth map. The, the same is true here for our ship silhouette. That's a piece of paper here, and we have the ship silhouette here as well. This is also made better. You can see here that it's transparent. You can see the numbers below it. And if we move the silhouette into a into an area that is um, too shallow, then the silhouette will turn red to give a feedback to the user that this is, this is not even. And also we have this ruler up here. That's also a tool that made it into the computer. You can see it here. Um, that is also improved because we have these uh, things here we can move around. And then um, here, well, this is, the resolution isn't, isn't high enough, but I can tell you here's a number which shows the, 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 the um, links from here to there, from these two point tips. Okay, so basic idea is we take the work objects from the real world, bring them into the computer. We use the actions from the real world and bring them into the computer. We use the language from the real world, bring it into the computer. And the same is also true for the structure. So we see how is our domain organized and how do we put it into the computer. And we're doing this on a UI level, we see that here, but we are also doing this on an architectural level and on a code level, we're going to look into that later. So what's interesting about this solution here is that it's a solution that just supports work of the nautical officers. So you can see here, um, the finding of the routes is still done manually with the system. here. Of course, one of the next steps will be that we have an algorithm or an artificial intelligence that um, finds this, this uh, route here and simulate this memory. But that's not done easily because you have to have a lot of nautical knowledge to do this stuff. That's why um, they said in the first step, we build um, we, we build a system, a system that supports the work of our nautical officers. We don't want to replace the nautical officers themselves because this is a highly security relevant area and we want to have people um, that, um, that make the decisions. And we want to have people that sign these decisions because then they can be blamed if something goes wrong. That's of course important. Okay, I was lucky to be part of the, of the team um, that, that built this software. And how did we start? How, how, um, <clears throat> started we with the, how did we start the project? So I have a feedback. No, 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 it's better. Um, so we, we were a group of programmers, of software developers, and the, the cyber was strong in, in us 
as you can see here. So we were asking the important questions or what we thought were the important questions when we started the project. And one important question is, what's the right programming language? So is it Java or is it C Sharp or PHP? And then of course, people come and say, well, PHP, is that, is that a real programming language? Um, I, I think yes, but um, many people won't, won't agree. So programming language, then operating system, will it be Linux or Windows? Um, and then next um, question is, what are the newest and hottest frameworks and what are the newest versions of these frameworks and how can we use them in our software? Because we want to play around with them. And there will probably a database be, be, be below our software and this database doesn't have to be a classical relational database or can we have this fancy new NoSQL stuff? And that's all good and well that we think about these questions. We're technical people in the end. But um, if we're lucky, someone comes at this point and says, well, stop. Um, you've asked these questions and answered these questions, but this is all technical stuff. And what does this have to do with, with what we were talking earlier about? What's, what does all this technical stuff have to do with this harbor stuff? Is any ship, has any ship come into the port easier because we made these decisions? Well, of course, no. That's a sad answer. And I have to tell you another sad truth at this point as well. And that is that software is not an end in itself. So we're not building software for itself. We're not building software for us but we're building software for someone else. So software is not an end in itself. Technical beauty is not an uh, end in itself. Yes, we want software. Yes, we want technical beauty, but only as a means to an end, not as an end in itself. And that means we don't want to die in technical beauty. Like with this trans rapid here, that's a, um, a project here in Germany in the, in the 80s and 90s um, for uh, for, for a new way of train, um, which um, is, is a magnetic train. Technical beauty, but never made it into a production. And that's what we don't want to do with our software. We want that our production, uh, that our software reaches production. So the goal in itself is, the software is not a goal in itself. What is the goal of software? And we never have to forget that the goal of software is to support our domain to support our user, to support our domain expert. That's the important person. We want her life to be easier, faster, more efficient. We want her life, her work to be better. That's the goal of our work. And there comes DDD into play because DDD tells us how we can build the software in a way that it makes the life um, of our users easier, faster, and more efficient. And the basic idea is that we build the software in a way that it's deeply rooted into the domain. So it should grow out of the domain, then it can be green and blossom like we can see here. So we don't want to build the software out there in outer space. We want it deeply connected, deeply rooted in the domain. Okay, that's, that's a nice idea, but what does this mean more concrete? This means we build the software as a reflection, as a mirroring of our domain. So we take the concepts from the real world, from the domain and put them into the computer. So we are building a model. This is why we're calling this a domain model. We take the things from the real world and put them into the software. And to do this, we have to bring the domain into our head here. We have to understand what's happening in the domain so that we can build the right software here. So it's important that we're not doing only this arrow right here, that we're not only um, just coding around, but that before we start coding and when we are coding again and again, in an iterative way, we always have to understand what's happening in the domain. We have to 
gain deeper insights into the domain, only then we can build good software here. So we look at the work that our users are doing and then we build a reflection of that in the software. So you remember we had this ship silhouette and this depth map, pieces of paper, and we build them into the software as well. And to do that, we have to understand our users. We have to understand our domain experts. So we have to get the domain knowledge that they have in their heads. And how do we gain this domain knowledge? How do we get into our users' brains? That's where collaborative modeling comes into play. So this idea that domain expert and developer are in the same room and work together on the domain, work together on the ideas and crunch on the knowledge together. Knowledge crunching is how Eric Evans, the father of DDD, caused that. So the idea is we get out the domain knowledge and chew on it until we get the juice out of it. We want to have the essence. There are different methods, of course, event storming, domain storytelling. Um, our, um, Two methods, event storming, that's with the sticky notes, um, domain storytelling, that's with uh, the stick figures. Okay, <clears throat> when we are using collaborative modeling to understand the domain, we can also understand the language of the domain. And that's something good because we want to have a common language between common between domain expert and developer. And the common language, as you can see here, has the color of the domain expert, not the color of the developer. So that means we as developers want to learn the language of the domain expert. We want to learn what a ship silhouette is, what a depth map is, how depth is measured, um, and so on. And we don't want to tell our domain experts what a class is, what a variable is, what a, what a method is. We want to learn the domain language. And we want to use that in our code as well. Okay. All this stuff has a philosophical background. So from Ludwig Wittgenstein, we know where of one, not, one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And we don't want to do that. We want to speak about this. Or in the German original, wovon man nicht sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen. And when we think about languages in a project, in a, in a software project, we have different languages. We have the technical languages, the technical language for our programmers, where we say things like, um, please deploy the container or can I push that to the feature branch? And it's good that we have this language because we can communicate that way with each other. But of course, this language is not well suited to communicate with real people of people um, that are using our software with users with domain experts. So on the other hand, we have this um, language of the domain, the business language, the domain language. And um, when we look into the port, we see where it's like the silhouette and the scale and the silhouette, the depth and the marking and so on. And these words are interesting for us developers as well. We want to learn them as well. And what's important, um, it's not enough to only learn the nouns that we can see here, but equally important, we want to learn the verbs as well. That's very important um, because nouns are easy to spot the things that we can find here, but um, the verbs, they show what's happening. They show the dynamics and we want to know them as well. Usually that's what we would support with software. So the depth that they are computed or um, that the ship silhouette is moved around. And of course, other kind of words can be interesting too, like um, adjectives here, the marking is neon yellow, or events like the ship is run around. Okay, <clears throat> so we want to have this common language as well. We have the technical language, we have the domain language. And we say, well, we have, want to have common language as well because we don't want to have um, this um, Babylonian problems of different languages. And we say, we build this common language on the domain words, not on the technical language. And since 
we are using this language everywhere, we call it ubiquitous language. Where do we get this ubiquitous language from? From collaborative modeling, when we look in onto our domain story, we find a lot of domain words and we can use them for our ubiquitous language. The cartographer calculates contour lines. All this stuff is not from technology. All this stuff is directly from the domain and that's good. Okay, and when depth map is an important word, we want to use it everywhere in our writings, in our diagrams, and in code. So here we can see what ubiquitous language means in a general purpose language. Here in Java or C sharp would be the same. We have a class depth map. And since we're using the same words everywhere, we call it ubiquitous. And that's great having ubiquitous language because with that we have solved one of the two hard problems of computer science. I don't know if you know this quote of Phil Carlton here. Are, according to him, there are only two problems um, in computer science. And one thing is cache invalidation and the other is naming things. And well, we don't know about cache invalidation yet, but we know, do know about naming things. We just name it with the words that we have in the domain. So we are just using the domain words in our code as well. Okay, two hard problems, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors, of course. So the next thing is DDD in the small. Um, this modeling and code or tactical design. And we're doing this by um, several rules of thumb. The first rule of thumb is let's look at the things at the work objects that we find and make classes out of them when we're working object oriented. So an important work object, important thing that we are working on here is the ship silhouette. And when the ship silhouette is important, then let's build a class silhouette out of this. And the second thing is to look into the verbs, into what's happening. So what are we doing with the ship silhouette? We are moving it around. And with these verbs, with these actions, we're building methods from that. So we can see here a class silhouette um, gets a method moved by a length. And what else do we do with a ship silhouette? We move it and we turn it. So another method will be turned by an angle. And here we can see what ubiquitous language means um, in a general purpose language. So Bob, you asked the question, is, is this the same as a DSL, as a domain-specific language? You can see here, this is not a DSL, this is a, um, a GPL, Java, and we still express the domain words here, silhouette, turn by, angle, move by. But of course, we can um, express this in a DSL, a domain-specific language as well. And maybe this would be a good idea to do it here, to have a DSL for, the, um, for describing the rules. Okay, so now we have a class here, we have methods here, and what we are building now, that's what is called a rich domain model. Um, a domain model with rich domain behavior. So we have real nice names for classes and methods, names with words from the domain, not technical names. So we're not doing things like this here, all getters and setters, which would be an dynamic domain model, but we're building a real behavioral rich domain model. More or less the basic idea of object orientation is this. You don't have to do this with OO, you can do it in function programming languages as well. Then we would have types and functions there. Okay, so the basic idea is when we go to a domain story, um, take the stick figures and make users out of them, the naughty officers here, so they won't become part of the software, they will use the software. Then take the work objects, these icons here, like ship, slit, and root, and make classes out of them. 
like here should so that should be a class and root of course would be another class. Um, and then we have this um, arrows here. Those are um, our activities as we are calling them in, in domain storytelling and they will turn into our methods like move and turn they will turn into methods. Okay, Bob, I passed uh, the opportunity to read the, the usual joke. Okay, please, <laughs> please do so. There are two hard problems in computer science. There are cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one zero, off yeah. by one error. Totally, totally, yeah. Here, sorry, I, I didn't show it earlier. <laughs> exactly. The, the joke being, <clears throat> you said there's two, and then you list three. Yeah, and then, of course, there's also the classic off by one arrows. OK, um, so um, off by one arrows and cache invalidation, well, we haven't found a solution at DDD yet, but we have found a solution for this naming things problem. Use the names from the domain. That helps a lot. And what we can see here is that we started with the interface. We didn't talk about the implementation yet. And that's also something good from Erich Gamma from the, um, <clears throat> from the Gang of Four, the design parents we know, program to an interface, not an implementation. Okay, that for DDD in the small, so take the the work objects make classes out of them, take the actions, make methods out of them. Now for DDD in the large. DDD in the large means we look at the domain as a whole, we look at the world as a whole. And we are asked the basic questions, like how can we understand the world? How do we get the world into our brain? And as you can see here, the world is much bigger than our brain. And fun fact, in real life, uh, the difference is much bigger. Nonetheless, we are able to understand the world, although the world is much bigger than our brain. How is that possible? That is possible because we don't really understand the whole world. We just understand parts of it. We are abstracting. Humans are able to abstract. To abstract mean take only the essential stuff, out of the world and leave out the inessential stuff. Another word for this is build a model. A model is something that contains only the essential stuff, only the juice, and all the inessential stuff is left out. So we can see here this is a model for the world. And as we can see, essential for the world is apparently that the world is turning. That's modeled in this model. Well, that's essential um, where we use this model, the globe, but how do we know what's essential? What's essential, what's not essential? Well, and as a good consultant, I have to say, it depends. I have to answer what the answer I always give to every question, it depends. And what does it depend on what's essential? It depends on the context. In different contexts, different properties of the world are essential. So that is the reason why we're not building only one model, but several models for different contexts, for different uses. So here, in this context, we have this globe here. Um, as I said, essential for this globe is that it's the world is turning. But when we look at this model here, this map, we can see this property, property that the world is turning is not modeled and the map here as well. Other properties are modeled here. The continents and their names. And um, we can see um, the surface of, of the Earth in one picture. But that the world is turning is not modeled here. This map, um, a so-called Mercator projection, is not without problems. Because when you come close to the poles, you can see here there's um, the stretching here. This is not how the poles really look like. So here in the pole up there, you can see 
Greenland looks like a very wide island. Truth is, when you look from the from the top of the North Pole onto onto the North Pole, then you can see here Greenland um, is a long island. That's why we have different maps here as well, like an like an orange here uh, peeled off. Um, and this um, here is an atlas. Um, and an atlas is basically a collection of def different models. For example, we have um, several pages that are all models for Africa. We have Africa politically, where we can see the countries and the, the borders and the capital cities. And we have Africa physically, where we can see rivers and <clears throat> mountains um, and so on. And other um, pages, other maps, other models for Africa are in there as well. We could put all this information into one map, but then we wouldn't understand um, the problems anymore. So that is, and th then we couldn't see the forest for the trees because we had too much information, too much detail. So a good model is a model that's not too big. So this is the philosophical or geographical view on models. And let's go back to computer science. We're doing the same here as well in CS. We're now taking the domain and building models out of that. We remember domain models. We were talking earlier about that. And now we are not building just one model per domain, but we are building several models for the domain as well. So we're not building only one domain model, but several domain models. That's the basic idea of strategic design. That means um, we have to draw clear boundaries between these, um, between these areas that we find these subdomains and for every subdomain we build its own model. It doesn't have to be as hard as this border here in Berlin. Um, we don't want to separate people, but we want a separate context. We want a separate models. And when we look at the domain and build several models for it, then we take the domain, cut it into pieces, into the subdomains. And for every piece of software, for every subdomain, we build such a box um, that is a piece of software. And in every box, there's a model in it, the domain model. And this box is called a bounded context. Bounded because there's a boundary around it, context because that's the context which gives the terms in a model meaning. And how do we find these contexts? Again, collaborative modeling can help us. Let's look at our domain story again. What we can do here is uh, ask the question which activities belong together? <laughs> And I would say in this story, the activities one, two, three, and four, they belong together and they form a subdomain, which could be called depth measurement. And we would build one piece of software for the depth measurement. And then we have the steps um, six, seven, eight, and nine, and they build another subdomain, maneuver planning. And the revolutionary idea of strategic design is to not build one monolithic harbor system, but to say we are building a system out of system, a system of modules. We will build one bounded context depth measurement and one bounded context maneuver planning, and they will be two modules, and these modules will be side by side. And these will be vertical modules, so that means depth measurement has its own UI, its own business logic, and its own data model. Its own data model. Oh my God, that's the point where we see, okay, dry, don't repeat yourself, is violated. Inside of a bounded context, we still wanna be dry in when we cross context boundaries, well, then it often gets wet, write everything twice. It doesn't have to be as extreme as this, but the important point is to see that it can be okay to have duplication when 
This gives us the possibility to have several models, not just one model, but several models. And these different models can be small models. The small model here for depth measurement and the small model here for maneuver planning. That helps us to get our hands on the complexity and to reduce the complexity. And reducing complexity is always good in, in programming. So example, as we can see here, we have the ship silhouette only in the maneuver planning. That means the class ship silhouette has only to be in this module in this bounded context up here. And we don't have to take care about ship silhouettes down here in the depth measurement. And then there's of course here contour lines in depth that are only in the depth measurement. And then we have a problem because here is the depth map. We can see it in depth measurement and in maneuver planning. And as I said, strategic design is revolutionary. Here we can see why, because we will say now we have two classes that are called depth map. One class depth map for the depth measurement and one class maneuver planning, uh, one class depth map for the maneuver planning. And they will model the same thing from the real world, but they will be two models and these models will be separate. We do not have one big model anymore, we have two small models. Okay, that's the idea of strategic design. I'm not going too deep into this because it's already late, getting late here. But um, that's probably the most revolutionary part of DDD, the strategic design, these multiple models. Okay, when we um, take only these bounded context here out of our domain story and leave the domain story out, then we get what's called a context map. Usually we not only have one domain story, but several domain stories and we um, extract from the domain stories knowledge and we build one context map that's a map of the different modules that we have in our system. Depth measurement, maneuver planning. And one thing is missing here. The next thing that we will add here is of course this title forecast. Okay, um, I'm going to skip over this. The clearest language for this bonded context. And I'm going to this because I wanted to give you an overview over several topics of DDD. So we have talked about ubiquitous language, the idea of using the domain terms and the software in the code. We have talked about tactical design, DDD in the small, take the work objects, make classes out of them, take the actions, make methods out of them. And we've talked about strategic design, DDD in the large, finding boundaries in the domain, so splitting up the domain into subdomains, and then building one module per subdomain, building one bounded context per subdomain. Okay, and now I should have a look at my watch. And doing that, I think, um, I'm not going deeper into many topics anymore. Um, one thing I want to show you um, that will only take five minutes, that's tactical design. When we're talking about an overview of DDD, um, we need some more words from these building blocks. And the most important are entity, value object, and domain event. So when we and go into this tactical design, take the work objects, make classes out of them. We can take these work objects and classify them. There are those where the identity is important for us. Those are usually things like our ship silhouette. So the, the identity um, is interesting for us. Um, and those we call entities or things like our depth map here. So this depth map is something else than this, that depth map here. So that's why we call them, uh, we are interesting in their identity. This one has another identity than that one. 
The same is true for these markings here. It's also an entity a thing. So entities have an identity and they usually also have a life cycle and they have a state. The state can be mutable. Entities are implemented as, oh, sorry. Entities are implemented as classes in Java and other languages as well. And um, as you can see here, I've annotated this class um, pipeline. I'm oh, sorry, here's the German version. So um, pipeline in English would be sounding chart. Um, I'm using an, an annotation entity here and beware, this is not JPA entity. This is DDD entity. I'm using a small framework here. It's called J molecules. Um, there are versions for PHP and .NET as well. So if you're interested in this, um, xmolecules.com um, would be the would be the would be the right um, thing to look at after. Um, I'm going. I, I'm I'm posting that in the chat. X molecules. more library to express um, architecture concepts. So this is an entity. Um, besides entities, there are values or value objects. So entities, things, and values. Values, we're not inter interested in the identity. So we're only interested in the value. These here are banknotes and we are not interested in the identity of a special bank note, we are interested in five euro bits, one euro bit. And when we look at values, they are some, somewhat timeless. So we are saying values always have to be immutable. Entities can be mutable, values must be immutable. So the important difference between entity and value is identity. How are we looking for the identity or aren't we? So here the depth, for example, that's a value because we're not interested in the identity of the symbol here, 11.5. We, we don't want to separate this 11.5 from that 11.5. We are only interested in the value here as well. Values. I can't yeah. help but to ask how is an, a value object, or excuse me, how is an entity any different than an object? Yeah. You have you're, data elements. You're, like you're totally right. You're totally right. Um, that's why I suffer um, with this word uh, value object a bit because how can it be both? Either it is a value or it is an object. And the point is in Java and um, in other languages, we have the, the problem as well. We, we are not able to um, define types that are not object types. So we have to simulate values with objects in Java. That's why they are called value objects. So to gain this here, not having an identity, um, we are overriding equals, um, for example. So because if we don't override equals, then we um, we inherit equals from the class object. And how is it implemented there? It compares the identity, the, which is the, the, the reference. Yeah. And why did Eric choose um, to not call it object, but why did he choose to call it entity? Um, the point is that we can have a technical difference. Entity is a thing from the real world, is the depth map here. Object is um, often something that is in the computer, an, an instance of a class, and we can have two technical objects that represent the same entity from the real world. But nonetheless, I, I, I totally agree that entity and object in the end are the same. That's why it's called object or object oriented because we take the things, the objects from the real world and put them into the computer. I would, my, my brain is saying, what's being described here as an, as an entity is in fact only one of the properties of an object because the object has a location, 
It's in this harbor at this geographic location, and this is the depth. And maybe there's two or three other versions of the depth, like a high, high limit and a low limit. And that would be an object that has value. It's not physical, but it's a, it's a data object, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, value objects are um, are often implemented as, as data objects. Um, what's important here is that um, these values are immutable. So we have to uh, make sure they, they can't be changed. So um, then we can um, move them around and um, have no, no problem with, with aliasing it and, and so on. Um, so, how do we implement value objects in Java? A again, example in Java, um, because I think that's still the most widely used language. Um, we don't have user-defined value types in Java, so we have to use classes. And as I said earlier, we, then we have to override equals. Um, in .NET, we would be able to use uh, value types, these st structs. I don't know if there are .NET developers here. Um, and in Java, there's also a project going on in, in um, at Oracle. It's called Project Valhalla, where they are working on um, bringing value types to the language. Um, in, in version in Java 15, um, they brought uh, these record types. I don't know if you've seen them. That. That's the first step in that direction. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to post that here as, as well. And again, you see here, I've, I've used this. So the new C-sharp, the new C-sharp language has imbued, uh, that has imbued ways of, sharp nine has imbued ways of, especially uh, using value types in .NET. So it comes built, imbued now with, with .NET. Other than that, you have to, you have to write it manually yourself and override the, some things to make it value type. But now it's C-sharp nine, it, it comes built with, with that language. So there are ways you can quickly say you, you can create value objects in .NET. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I would argue it, it. I would argue again, it depends um, on, on what, what you are doing. So for for this thing here, this this um, Tiefensau, which is a depth number, um, I think a struct would be a good idea um, so because that's a value type, and we don't want we don't want a reference type here uh, because um, this, this depth number, that's only a byte and we don't want to have 16 bits of a pointer to point to somewhere um, on, the, on the heap um, to find eight bytes of, of a depth number. And as you saw earlier, there are many, many depth numbers in, in one of these depth maps. But that's a technical reason, of course, um, and that's less important. So still we could do it in, in um, C sharp older than um, version nine, we could also use classes here and that might also be right. And now we have the, the, the record types there as well. Yes, and, and, and Bob, of course um, in Kotman, um, we have um, other, and other languages we have, um, we have um, mechanisms that, that will, um, will be better as well. Um, it's well in, in Kotman, or if you look into the Scala, they have these case classes that um, can also help you as well. Um, but again, that's all technology. As we can see here, here um, even in a language that doesn't support it very well, like um, Java before uh, uh, 14, uh, we can simulate it with um, the means that we have there. And more important than the technical stuff is here again is the um, is the mindset um, and getting clear that both is important, having objects and having values, or in DDD speak, having um, entities and having value objects, because both are important concepts. And that's something that most programming languages, from my point of view, don't get right, because most programming languages say either everything is an object or everything is a value. Object-oriented programming languages typically say everything's an object. And Java says, except the primitive types. And functional programming languages usually say everything is a value. 
but both are interesting concepts and both are needed for most interesting domains. Okay, so much about entities and value objects, um, things and values. And then there's another um, building block and that's the last new thing that I'm going to, to put into your brains today. And that's the domain event. A domain event says something has happened in the domain, something that's relevant to our domain experts, to our users, to our subject matter experts has happened. And these domain events can be used for um, a bunch of different things. One of them is communication and loose coupling in this communication. For example, when these boxes are different bounded context, then this context here can raise a flag and say something has happened. And then one of the other contexts can look at this and do something about it, or another context can ignore it. And this context doesn't care about it if they ignore it or if they do something about it. So that helps for this loose coupling. Example, we have this depth map created here. Sorry that I have only these. Oh, sorry, but I only have the German versions here. So this is here um, the bounded context depth measurement, and that is the bounded context maneuver planning. And we have a domain event depth map created. And that's something that's used as um, a means of communication between depth map and manual plan. Okay. Um, so much about my overview over DDD. I know that's a lot of stuff. And of course, um, it would be interesting to go uh, into all these topics in more detail. Um, but um, I think that would be just too much now. So I know this has been a kind of a, a par force ride that, that we did here. Okay, Could so- you possibly go back a couple of slides here. I wanted to see something. Keep yeah. going, please. Um, As the two ships or in the event, keep yeah. backing up. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to, this here, right? Um, and one more, actually. My brain is interpreting this as a pub sub model. Yeah. Where the one watching is the subscriber and the publisher is the domain event. Yeah. Okay. It, it, um, the, the publisher publishes the domain ex event, to be exact. Right. And it can have as many subscribers or watchers, as, if you yeah. will, yeah. as are desired. Yeah, yeah. So PubSub or observer pattern is another word for that. That's one of the purposes um, for domain events. Another purpose where we can use domain events is event sourcing, um, which means um, we store the state of an entity not with the actual the current state, but by using the history of events that have happened to this thing. So when we think about the um, about the um, ship silhouette, we can either store in a classical way the, the current position, or we could store the start position and then all the events that happened to this. So this moved 100 meters, turn about 20 degrees, um, moved 50 meters and so on. So then we would store the history of events. And um, when we want to know the, the current position, then we would have to calculate it out of the history. We have to reconstruct it basically mm -hmm. to whatever target time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually in, in this um, implementation here in the harbor, we have this event stores implementation because that's interesting because we want to find this route and we want to give our captain in the end, what, what we want to say him, um, uh, move 100 meters and then turn around and so on. So it, it, here it is interesting. But you gotta source it, it's not always the right or thing. you'll lose the tide. <laughs> Sorry? And don't go too slow or you'll lose the tide. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but also don't go too fast either <laughs> because yeah. then, then you won't be faster than the tide. <laughs> 
exactly. So those are two of the um, of the uses of domain events, um, event sourcing, or um, publish subscribe. But there are other uses as well. So those those are basically blocks. Okay. Are there more questions um, on this? Yeah, have you sold this to the Suez Canal? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but seems but like our, right our sales department is working on it. <laughs> yeah, it seems like that the Pilots Association for the Suez Canal would be a very ripe target for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree totally. Um, I mean, um, what's um, uh, what's um, important about the system is um, so that, that's why it's not uh, that is why it's only built for one harbor and not generally applicable is that um, we need um, uh, it makes sense to have such a system when you have a harbor which is shallow on the one hand and has this tidal situation on the other hand so that's why it's um, not interesting for most parts um, but of course there are um, situations where, where it's interesting but it, it hasn't been sold um, so far to other parts yeah, anything that's connected to the ocean is going to have tides by definition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but um, and this works um, very well in our situation because um, northern Germany is pretty flat. So that means wow. we have we, we have um, a big tide even um, um, in the in the hinterland. Um, so if you have um, I don't know if the mountains go directly into the sea, um, then of course there will be a tide, but but not very far, and then, then it's not, um, it's not a problem. Or uh, see they, how they, that would make it much more complicated because then you're not only dealing with depths, you're also yeah. dealing with currents quite a bit, yeah. much more so than if it's relatively flat. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah, so much about um, the building blocks. Um, I'm going to jump yeah, to, to here again. So this, this is my parafors right for today. What are we doing with this now? Um, yeah, usually I, um, this is the point where you say there's, there's a lively community all over the world about uh, different meetups, uh, but you already know that. <laughs> Um, the, the Africa is missing here. I only have the German meetups here. Sorry. Um, but uh, other things that are important or interesting for the communities, there, uh, there are um, um, three conferences that um, are dedicated to DDD. One is Ken Dinsky in Germany. One is Domain Driven Design Europe in Amsterdam. And um, then there's also um, Explore DDD that's in Denver. Um, so I think exploring DDD this year will also, it will again be online. So um, that, that will be in September or October. Okay, so there's, um, if you're interested in this stuff, there, there are a lot of conferences to go. And if you want to get more hands-on, if you want to see some, something more concrete, then there's the Leasing Ninja. That's a project of mine, leasingninja.io where I take one domain and analyze it uh, with domain stories and then show how can you um, find bounded context in there and how can you build models inside the, the bounded context and how can you implement that in Java and on other languages. The Java version is, is not finished, but is, um, um, well, it's the most adult version, yeah, if you can say that. Um, it's the most grown-up version, and the other versions, the .NET version, well, and the PHP version, they are they are beginnings. So I'll share with you because I think it's noteworthy. It was certainly a surprise to me. A dear friend of mine, who's quite literally a Java superhero, voted as such during a, a Java One conference, has sworn off Java. Says never again. It's Kotlin or die. Forget about it. No more Java. <laughs> <laughs> He's that much enamored by what 
Kotlin provides. Mm -hmm. And I thought, coming from that guy, that's really quite impressive. Yeah. yeah uh, to be honest, I agree. I, I like Kotlin very much as, um, as well. I, I think they did some very clever um, decisions, especially that they said, we, we are building the better Java. We're not building um, a totally different language uh, where developers have to learn, learn a new paradigm or so on. So the, 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 the switch from Java to Kotlin is not hard in the beginning. And then you can move on and do some, uh, some, some, some great stuff there. But um, there, there's not a not yet um, a, a Kotlin version of the Disney Ninja. Sorry about that, but there, there will be <laughs> certainly. Okay, so so much for the hands-on stuff, um, and of course there's literature. So if you want to look at my slides again, um, this is you can find that in my speaker deck. And if you want to read on in for DVD, of course. This is the Bible, the Big Brew book by Eric Evans. Um, if you don't have much time um, and don't want to read 800 pages, then DDD is still from by Vaughan Vernon's, maybe the, the first book you want to go to. And if you're interested in domain storytelling, um, there's also a book that um, a colleague of me and I um, have written. It's called Domain Storytelling, Collaborative Modeling for Agile and DDD. And usually it costs $15 online on Meanpub, but not for you. Um, here's the special DDD Africa discount uh, where you get it for uh, $10 instead of 15. So now is the time to make a screenshot. Um, and of course I will uh, post that link into the chat. Uh, I don't have it yet, but yeah, I will do that in the, in the aftermath. Okay, and since I'm doing advertising, I also always like to do to advertise for something good. Um, so do something good, uh, make a blood donation that's required, um, especially in these times. Um, and I'm near the end. That's mostly it. Thank you for your time and happy end. And of course, I'm open for questions. And now this is the time where you and have to use the clap emoji in the chat or anywhere. There you go. <laughs> Is there an emoji in there? I guess that must be. So you can unmute yourself for questions. And um, Helen, thank you for um, the presentation. That was an awesome. Um, you've learned a lot from that. So we want to say thank you for the time and everything that you've done for us. We appreciate that. Um, so if anyone has question, yeah. uh, if anyone has question, you can unmute yourself and ask. So I have one question, um, which is related to the third card design. And I think the third card design is just, I, I, I might say it's a low level design because that's where you have to have your entities, your value objects and stuff, right? And at the end of it, you are using those to build like um, or it's a, like a bounded contest or something. So would you say that uh, the tactical design fits within the uh, the static design or something? Mm -hmm. So um, what I would say is um, um, tactical design is less universal uh, than strategic design. Strategic design is something that I would uh, always do for a project of a certain size, for a project of a certain complexity. But having found the bounded context, not for every bounded context, tactical design is the right choice because tactical design um, is not easily done. And of course, um, we have these different building blocks, we have to use different patterns and so on. and um, when the, the subdomain is not complex enough, then it's not worth it to do it, which is a pity because um, I'm, a, I'm an old OO guy. And I'm, a, um, I'm, I'm a fan of tactical design, but it's not uh, the right thing to do in every, um, in, in every subdomain. And I, we, I haven't talked too much about context mapping, but uh, when we found these different subdomains, just these different contexts, then it's uh, interesting to ask, what's core and what's not 
what's the core domain and what's only supporting. And typically for the core domain, you want a elaborated model, you want a tactical design, you want um, high uh, test coverage and all this stuff, you want high quality, but maybe for the supporting stuff, it's just not worth it to put all this effort in, in, into it. Okay, thank you. And that's um, of course also true, that not only for tactical design, but also for um, what we're scratched only on um, hexagonal architecture, clean architecture and this stuff. So that's, that, that, that goes hand in hand. So that this cleanness, um, you want to be very clean in the core domain, but in the supporting domain, you may well, you, you may well live with some dirt <laughs> in there. Anyone with a question? Okay, so we, that's 7.44 at my end. That's almost um, one hello. hour, five minutes. He yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi, hello. Yeah, it's um, been a wonderful session um, and um, so far so good. It's been quite enlightening. But uh, um, yeah, so far so good again. I've, um, I think I followed up, I followed up, followed up very well to everything you said. But for some time now, working on DDD, something has been very, very confusing to me. And um, I think maybe you might just, you might just shed light on it. You didn't really shed light on it, but probably you might just help shed light on it, which is, the, okay. When, when if, if, if you try to integrate um, or, or infuse plain architecture and um, DDD, if you decide to infuse both architectures together, now you have your, your, your and you try to implement CQRS. So you have your handlers, your, your query handlers or command handlers. Now, most times you have your your so so that's where the confusion is coming from when you're infusing uh, uh um, clean architecture and um CQRS and probably use the mediator pattern do you how do you now differentiate your application logic and um you have get your your application services logic and your domain uh, logic how do you separate both of them so how do you understand the thin line where to place um both logics i don't know if you if you are getting here if I'm, if I'm clear enough. Yeah. Maybe um, I try to find another slide back of mine, sorry, um, that may help shed a light on this. Um, I, I shortly mentioned this, this architecture hamburger, as I call it. So that, that brings all this stuff together. And um, I think um, all these architectural styles, they all have important things to say and none of them brings it all together. That's why I think, why I think it makes sense to, to bring it together ourselves and that's what um, the burger is about. Um, I'm, I will show that shortly here and um, maybe that's a topic for, for, for another talk. Um, on another day. Um, okay, wait a second. How are you going to make us hungry? The hamburger reference. Sorry. Um, I uh, just have to find my color again and then. I show it. Okay, sorry. Please ask the question again. Um, you, you, Baba, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. So I was trying to say in the scenario where you try to infuse domain-driven design and clean architecture. So in clean architecture, you have your in your clean architecture, you implement um say CQRS, um using a mediator pattern. So in your in your in your application service, what kind of logic do you have there? Because you 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 decide in your domain your domain your domain layer, each of your domain you don't want anemic domain you want a rich rich domain. So in your domains, do you have? So what logic what logic do you place in what in your application service? What logic do you place there in your domain your domain objects? What kind of behavior do you place there? Yeah. So first which, of which, all... which of which of them which of them talks to your database? Mm -hmm. Do you understand so, what I'm saying? So is it the, is the application service calls the domain behavior? The domain behavior executes your CRUD 
and responds back to the application service. Application service responds back to the UI or your API. So just in summary, just help me explain that. Yeah. So first of all, um, the, the most important part um, is the domain model of, of um, a piece of software. So that's the patty in this burger here. That's what's called entities in, um, in clean architecture or um, domain layer in, in DDD. And then around this patty, all the other stuff is built. So the, the application layer is the cheese and the burger and the UI and the infrastructure, that's the, 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 the roll of the bread that's come from the outside. And when we zoom into these different layers or rings, depends on how you look at it, then we can see there is more inside. So in the PADI, we have the value object and the entity. We talked about them earlier. And we have other patterns as well, like um, domain service and repository. Repository interface, to be exact. So, and what we um, show next um, are these arrows. And these arrows mean um, uses, that's this arrow here, or is a... That's this arrow here. And as you can see, all the arrows go to the inside, go into the paddy. So the domain layer does not know anything about the outside world. That's why I use the hexagon here as well, because that's the hexagonal architecture. This is the inner stuff, and this presents its ports to the outside where we can put adapters on. And there are two kinds of adapters primary adapters and secondary adapters. Primary adapters, that's what the use case here is using. That thing just calls method here. So the, the, um, the port is just a method that can be called and the adapter is a method call. Well, kind of boring. More interesting is what's happening to below here. And then we come to the point where's your, your, your data access and your CRUD happening. That's here. We have... Um, here, a repository interface that's part of the domain layer, and we have a repository implementation that's part of our infrastructure layer. And the repository implementation knows the repository interface because it implements that. And um, this repository implementation does know the data model on the one hand and does know the domain model on the other hand. So this does the um, mapping between domain model and data model. And that's typically an OR mapping because we have objects here and relations there. Doesn't have to be that way, but that's, that's, a, typical, that's a typical thing. So here we're doing the, the OR mapping. So we have the inside here. That's what Uncle Bob um, Martin calls entities. But as you can see here, entities is not enough. We have other things as well. So we need the tactical design there as well. But um, for the different layers, we also need other uh, things. We need the use cases here. We have them in clean architecture, for example, but we can use can find use cases on, on other places as well. And here the UI, we again have another pattern language. Here I've used MVC, model view controller. So that's another pattern language, like this tactical design is a pattern language. Pattern language is um, a language of patterns that means different patterns that work together. And we, um, we need them all to build, build the whole software, build the whole um, bounded context out of it. So this is one bounded context, the burger. This is a core bounded context because we have this rich domain model here. So that was Oliver's question. Do we always want to do technical design here in the burger? Yes, but usually we have some fries and a salad and a Coke besides that. And there's, yeah, there's fries architecture. There's no below enough, but that's a supporting domain. Everything is connected to everything. So, hey, so, so in, the end we, in the end, we make a lunch out of it or dinner by, by having uh, different uh, bond accounts with different architecture. So can I take a, a swing at this? I'd like to see if I, my understanding is correct by asking you a couple of questions. Um, oh, sure. The repository implementation, that could be a, an ORM, an object relationship manager, like a hibernate or something, right? Exactly. Right. And then the data model is going to be literally a database of some form, whether it's a document database or SQL or whatever. Exactly. And it just 
has those relationships, whatever form they might take, and they're addressed in a particular way with the ORM. Um, and then the basically the implementation details, the, the business rules, the controller, so to speak, is the middle part with a hexagonal shape. And it doesn't know anything about or care anything about how a particular application is using the rule set that it implements. So there's actually another layer of these use cases that says, from the point of view of a user trying to solve a problem, this is the thing that controls the interactions with maybe a UI that corresponds to what the user's expectations are to, to speak to the, the implementation layer or the controller, basically. Is that essentially correct? That is essentially correct. And a, a few points, um, the repository implementation usually is not the, the ORM itself, but usually uses an ORM. So this is typically a class that, that we define, and this, this is Hibernate, a library that we're using. Mm -hmm. um, then for the hexagonal stuff, the repository interface, that's a part, the repository implementation, that's an adapter. And this is a, a secondary port, secondary adapter here. And what we're using here is dependency inversion, the DIP, the, the D from solid. So we're, we're talking under Bob again here. Uh, because this year, this dependency is inversion. The classic um, dependency is that we say we have these layers, and that means we can access from below to above. UI can access application, application can access domain model, domain model can access infrastructure. And this last, this last dependency, domain model accesses infrastructure that we turn around. That's where we're doing dependency inversion. Right. So we make the, the infrastructure dependent on um, the on the um, um, on, on the domain model or the business rules or entities or however they are called in, in the um, in, in, in the architecture model. So one of the and, things and, and I agree it's it's very important to say this does not know and does not care what's happening outside it. In theory, of course, in real life there may be constraints that. Um, have an impact on the inside that comes from the outside. But we want to um, have this impact as small as possible. And we don't want any technology inside here. That's why I painted this stuff here, this, this green stuff. So we don't want to know about the ORM here. I don't want that my, um, my um, depth map or my depth numbers or my ship silhouette do know anything about um, hibernate or do anything about the widget library, which might be React or, um, or Angular today, but was WPF when you built the system. So that this, this system is partly built in Java, partly in .NET, and the, the, the UI is built in, um, in, in .NET, and we use WPF there. But um, th th this domain logic doesn't care about WPF or React or Hibernate or a database. So we want to that we want this core to be independent of this stuff. That's why clean architecture is called clean because we keep this business rules, this domain model clean of technology. So one of the other things that occurs to me is that from an isolation point of view in terms of testing, not the entire depth all the way from the top to all the way to the bottom and back, each of those air gaps between the, the bun and the burger and the whatever is an opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to mock the bun in order to test the use case layer. Exactly. And vice versa. And as I go further and further, each of these air gaps is an opportunity to say, this is an isolation test, not an integration test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this, this then is the especially true. way higher when you actually get around to doing an iteration test or an end to end test. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. I agree totally. And this is especially true for this repository interface. And that's very important because that gives us the possibility to mock the repository interface and we don't have to have a real database uh, when we want to test this domain stuff. Even if we want to test not just one entity, one value object, but more of this domain layer, we still can mock this repository 
here by just plugging a, a, a mock implementation for test reasons here on the, at the interface. And we don't have to care about the real database implementation. And, yeah, and that's, super... that's real power, then that's real quality that you can bring into the domain layer. And when we have quality in the domain layer, then to have quality in the other layers is not so hard anymore. Of course, it still is, but this is the most important part right. to, to get right. That's the thing that so many people that are used to testing end to end, yeah. all the way from the UI down to the database and back. And, and they are the victim of their own process because, well, if I don't have the right database loaded, I have no way to assert that X, Y, or Z is gonna happen yeah. because I'm not in control of what's down there. Yeah. Yeah. That's why yeah. you use mocks because you can create the conditions that you are trying to validate. Like a game that's got a randomizer. You play, replace the randomizer and say, in this case, when I call you, I expect you to give me, I don't know, some kind of a weird condition that would be hard to duplicate. And that's the power of mocks. Agreed. Totally agreed. Um, and, and that's something that we don't want here. We don't want any random stuff here. For example, we don't want um, access to time here. We want to inject the time inside here so we can uh, be exact about the, the, the testing. Then you can create the conditions that you're specifically at trying to examine. Yeah. yeah. It's in your control. How else are you supposed to make an assert? Exactly. You don't know what the conditions are. Exactly. So this is um, designed for right. testability. Um, and that's... Um, where's my slide for this? Yeah, so that's that's very important um, for all these kinds of architecture, um, hexagonal clean. Or th this is a this is a quote from from um, here from Onion Architecture, but it's basically the same idea. We are, we already we are, again have these rings. Here it's called domain model and domain services and application services, which is called business rules and use cases by Uncle Bob, but the the principle is the same. And the important part is this year, um, all application code can be compiled, run, and tested separate from the infrastructure. So we don't have to uh, care about UI. We don't have to care about um, database. And we, we still can, uh, we, we, we just can test our business rules. Um, and, and that's great for unit testing. And that's of course, plays well with TED. So the best thing to do here is TED um, let the, the tests um, drive your, your implementation of the domain model. So Jimmy Rainsberger has a great talk called uh, rather provokingly, mm -hmm. integration tests are a sham. Mm -hmm. And then he proceeds to destroy all the assumptions about why integration tests are necessary or desirable by bringing it into the kinds of layers that you had depicted there and saying, if you've got starting from here and going to there and you have all these layers in between, you have basically an end to the power of something or another use cases mm -hmm. of things that can go wrong. If you instead, you only go from here to here across one layer, you can reliably say the case where this is true, the case where that is true, and reliably get all of those things in a much smaller number of tests, and then repeat the same thing for the next layer and the next layer. And it becomes so much more manageable and your tests run faster. Duh. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, that's why I like um, that XP Extreme Programming um, distinguishes only two kinds of tests, unit tests and acceptance tests. They're, they're not talking about integration or end-to-end -end or um, a whole system level test. They just say, we have, we have the unit tests. Those are important. We want to have many of those. And then, of course, acceptance tests slash integration test, slash, test, slash, slash test, test, we want to have some of them as well to check the whole system is working as well, but we don't want to have all these cases. We want to have just one scenario or two scenarios there. So we were talking about the, the test pyramid here, of course, as well. That's but, basically a smoke test at the mm -hmm. outermost layers from end yeah. to end. 
do all the pieces that that individually do what we think they're supposed to do, do they actually play well together? Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Okay. Yeah, also, so much for, for the architecture hamburger. Um, that's something that has to be written down, but <laughs> it hasn't been done yet. It's, it's on my list. <laughs> but so if you want to go deeper into that, um, there are slides um, that you can find in my speaker deck if you want to have a look at it more detail. But, but I think there's no no recording of that talk yet. Well, Henning, we should probably let you go because it's after 10 where you are, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, it, 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 it has think... turned dark now. <laughs> uh, 10, 4. Um, Femi, I think your answer, uh, your question was right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's quite clear. Thank you yeah. very much. Or, or is there another question? I, that's that's okay for me. So, <laughs> if, if there's one or two short questions, that that won't be a problem. Thank you, Mike, for putting this on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I think there are no other questions. Okay. So thank you very much once again, and we appreciate everything that you have us. So yeah. hopefully, uh, we might organize another kind of meet up with you. And yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for your time. I enjoyed it very much. And yeah. Yeah. S see you on one of the next meetups around the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think we are going to... Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we are going to end the meetup for today. And thanks to everyone who joined us. So see you again in our next...